Daniel 7, they claim that the son of man is Muhammad. God's curse be upon Muhammad. Okay, now let me destroy that lie. Let's begin. I kept looking in the night visions, and behold, with the clouds of heaven, one like a son of man was coming. And he came up to the Ancient of Days and came near before him. And to him was given glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, and men of every language might serve him. This, okay, that's going to be relevant in a minute. His dominion is everlasting dominion, which will not be taken away, and his kingdom is one which will not be destroyed. So now let me prove to you first, both according to rabbinic Judaism and Christianity, this son of man is the Messiah. Whom both Christians and Jew, uh, Muslims, Christians and Muslims admit is Jesus. And I'm going to show you from New Testament. First, let's go to Chabad.org. All right, here we go. Rashi's coming. Now, Chabad.org has provided their own translation of the Tanakh Old Testament with the commentary of a medieval rabbi, Rashi, who was anti Christian. So let's see what he says. Okay, Rashi, this is his commentary. Who's the one like a man? That is King Messiah. You see it? Rashi, who's not a Christian, agrees with the Christians. The one like a son of man of Daniel is the King Messiah, Melech Mashiach. Now let's see the New Testament. Now according to the New Testament, who is this son of man who rides the clouds of heaven? Oh, you don't need to guess. Let's go here. Jesus, New Testament. Who is that son of man who rides the clouds of heaven? Mark 14. 61 62. But he kept silent, did not answer. Again, the high priest was questioning him and said to him, Are you the Christ, the Son of the Blessed? And Jesus said, I am, and you shall see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the power and coming with the clouds of heaven. Game over. The rabbis say it's the Messiah, and Jesus says it's about the Messiah, and that's me. And Muslims say Jesus is the Messiah. All right. All right, everyone got it? How about Revelation? Revelation 1, 12 to 18. Who does John see by the Holy Spirit enabling him to see him? And whose voice does he hear? Then I turned to see the voice that was speaking with me. And having turned, I saw seven golden lampstands. And in the middle of the lampstands, I saw one like a son of man. Oh, wow. So who did he see? He heard a voice. He turned. He goes, I saw one like a son of man clothed in a robe. Reaching to the feet and girded across his chest with a golden sash. So he turned to hear the voice speaking to him loudly to see who it is. And the Holy Spirit is enabling him to hear him audibly and see him. He goes, I saw one like a son of man. Well, how do we know this is Jesus? Right here. When I saw him, I fell at his feet like a dead man. And he placed his right hand on me, saying, Do not fear. I am the first last. The living one, and I was dead. That's how I know it's Jesus. And behold, I'm alive forever and ever. And I have the keys, the authority, the power over the realm of death and Hades. Saw one like a son of man, and he told me he's the one who died and now lives forevermore. Right? So that's him, right? Son of man. And we know Jesus because he's the one who died. Now, okay. Notice this here earlier, Revelation 1 7. Behold, he's coming with the clouds. Hmm. Who is it? Every eye will see him, even those who pierced him. Oh, Jesus. You catch it? The one who's coming with the clouds is the one who was pierced. The Father wasn't pierced. The Holy Spirit wasn't pierced. Jesus was pierced when he was on the cross. And it says he's the one coming with the clouds. So notice, in Revelation 1, the one they pierced is the one coming with the clouds. So then. Jesus just revealed himself to John as this son of man. I saw in the night visions with the clouds of heaven, one like a son of man was coming. Right? But now let's go a little deeper, right? Okay. Now I want you to see something else. How do we know that the son of man is not a mere creature? Number one, he rides the clouds of heaven. This is a fact of the Old Testament. And this is a fact of ancient Near Eastern mythologies. Writing the clouds, writing with the clouds around the clouds, is a function which only gods, goddesses do. Let me repeat. 
in light of its ancient historical context, Near Eastern context, even the pagans believe that gods, goddesses, ride clouds. And in the Old Testament, Yahweh and the angel of Yahweh, who's not a creature, they are the cloud riders. That means anyone who knows their Old Testament Anyone at the time of Daniel and the pagans in Babylon would know that the one like a son of man who rides the clouds is not a mere creature or a human creature, but a divine being. So let me show you. Riding the clouds. Let's see the Old Testament witness. Isaiah 19, verse 1. Behold, Yahweh is riding on a swift cloud and is about to come to Egypt. The idols of Egypt will shake at his presence, and the heart of the Egyptians will melt within him. 1 Kings 8, 10 to 13. Who shows up in a pillar of cloud that they see visibly when Solomon builds the temple? Let's see. Now it happened that when the priest came out of the holy place, the cloud filled the house of Yahweh so that the priest could not stand to minister because of the cloud, for the glory of Yahweh filled the house of Yahweh. Then Solomon said, Yahweh said that he would dwell in the cloud of dense gloom. I have surely built you a lofty house and a place for your dwelling forever. All right. Deuteronomy 33, 26. There is none like the God of Jeshurun, another name for Israel, who rides the heavens to your help and through the skies in his majesty. Are, are we seeing a pattern? Exodus 13, 21, 22. And Yahweh was going before them in a pillar of cloud by day to guide them on the way and a pillar of fire by night to give them light that they may go by day and by night. He did not take away the pillar of cloud by day nor the pillar of fire by night from before the people. Now notice who's also controlling the cloud, maneuvering the cloud, steering the cloud. Watch Exodus 14, 19 and 20. Then the angel of God <clears throat> who had been going before the camp of Israel moved and went behind them now notice when he goes from the front to the back the pillar moves and the pillar of cloud moved from before them and stood behind them behind them do you understand the implication when the angel moves the pillar cloud moves because he's steering the cloud and so it came between the camp of egypt and the camp of israel and there was the cloud along with the darkness yet gave light at night so they're seeing a cloud by day of that appeared as fire by night. That was the fire of Yahweh to give them light. Thus the one did not come near the other all night. Notice, the angel of God, who was ahead of Israel, moved to the rear. When he moved, the pillar moved. So you know who the Son of Man is. And who else is in the pillar? <clears throat> then at morning, Exodus 14, 26, 26. 14, 24, 26. Yahweh looked down on the camp of the Egyptians through the pillar of fire and cloud and brought the camp of the Egyptians into confusion. So that's the first line of evidence showing the Son of Man is not a creature. You see it? Second line of evidence. You see this word serve? Notice all nations, not some. Every nation. In all languages, not some languages. That means you Arabs, you Muslims, all peoples, not some, must and shall worship him. I'm going to show you what the word serve is. Must and shall worship him forever and ever because he will rule over them forever and ever. Meaning he's not just for the Jews. Now let me show you how the NIV renders serve and they capture the meaning beautifully. What does the verb serve mean here? He was given authority, glory, and sovereign power, and peoples of every language worshipped him. You see it? Now, the verb is Aramaic. Let's see what it is. Right here. It's Aramaic, and it's yipilachun, pilach. This word, pilach, is only used in the book of Daniel for the worship of that God alone is to receive. Let me repeat. You got to hear this. The Aramaic verb, pilach, is only used in the book of Daniel for the worship that only God is supposed to receive. If you give this to anyone else, you are sinning. And it's connected with the worship given to God by priests. 
Okay. Let me show you. Do you remember the story of Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, the three Jews? They were thrown in the fire, right? That's going to come up later. I'm going to use NIV for now. They were thrown in the fire. Why were they thrown in the fire? Because they refused to worship the golden image of Nebuchadnezzar that he erected and refused to give pilach to anyone other than their God. Daniel 3.12. So they go to Nebuchadnezzar saying, but there are some Jews whom you have set over the affairs of the province of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who pay no attention to you, your majesty, they neither serve, that's that verb, pilach, your gods, see? They only give pilach to the true God, nor worship the image of gold you have set up. So then they're asked, Daniel 3, 14, ready? And Nebuchadnezzar said to them, is it true, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, that you do not serve, same Arabic verb, my gods or worship the image of gold I have set up? Yep. Now notice what they say to him. Look at faith. If we are thrown into the blazing furnace, if you throw us into the fire, the God we serve, there it is, serve. The one we give pilach to is able to deliver us from it, from the fire. And he will deliver us from your majesty's hand. His hand is over your hand. But even if he does not, now notice faith. Even if he doesn't save us from the fire, right? We want you to know, your majesty, we will not serve pilach your gods or worship the image. That's a different word. You have set up. So when he threw them in the fire, God miraculously saved them. Now watch how it's used elsewhere. Daniel 6, 16. So the king <clears throat> gave the order and they brought Daniel and threw him into the lion's den. The king said Daniel to Daniel, may your God whom you serve continually, Pilach, rescue you. All right. Daniel 6, 20. When he came near the den, he called to Daniel in an anguished voice, Daniel, servant living God, has your God whom you serve continually been able to rescue from the lions the son of man receives pilach which is given only to god in the book of daniel watch here he was given authority glory and sovereign power all nations and people of every language worshiped him same verb pilach by all peoples in all languages from all nations as he rules over them forever. But then later on in Daniel 7, 27, we are told the highest ones, the most highs, el -yunin, they're the ones who will be worshipped and obeyed. And the word worship is pilach. Now let's see where this verb is used. Same word, see? Ye pilechun, pilach, Daniel 3, 28. They would not give ye pilechun to anyone other than their God. The Son of Man will receive Pilach, Yipelechun. They will Yipelechun. Serve Him, who all nations, all languages, all peoples, or they will suffer the consequences. And it's the same verb used here. Daniel 7, 27. The kings will give Pilach, Yipelechun, to the highest ones. But let me show you that in Daniel 7, 27, Pilach is being given to the highest ones, plural, plural, not singular. Watch. Why is it plural? Look at here. When you go here, El Yonin, you see the in, I, N, in? That's a masculine plural suffix. It makes the word plural. That's why if you put your curse here, it says adjective, masculine, plural. The saints of the highest ones the most highs why because in chapter 7 same chapter verse 9 thrones plural ancient of days son of man two and they both reign together on thrones and they both reign forever over all nations peoples and languages that's why they're called the highest ones all right so now, do you understand? This is the second line of evidence that the Son of Man is God. 
He rides the clouds, which is something only divine beings do. In the Old Testament, only Yahweh and his divine angel do. He is worship as God. He receives the worship that's to be given to God alone. Could it be any clearer this son of man is God appearing as a man? Right? And yet he's not the ancient of days in this context, because that would be the father. So here you have the father and son. Now, to further prove it to you, and by the way, he rules forever like God does. And his rule means he'll be worshipped forever as God will be. So the only king who's an eternal king who rules forever over all nations, peoples, and languages who then must worship him forever. The only king who will be worshipped forever is God. And yet this son of man is worshipped forever as he rules over all nations forever. Here, who, who reigns forever as the king who will be worshipped? <clears throat> Here. He was given authority, glory, and sovereign power. All nations and peoples of every language worshipped him. For how long? <clears throat> his dominion is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away, and his kingdom one that will not never be destroyed. Look what the Persian king says about the God of Daniel. I issue a decree that in every part of my kingdom, people must fear and reverence the God of Daniel, for he is the living God and he endures forever. His kingdom will not be destroyed. His dominion will never end. Now, don't misrepresent my argument. I'm not saying because the Son of Man reigns forever, <clears throat> that makes him God. No, because in Daniel we're told his holy saints, believers, will share in his reign forever. We will reign forever if we're believers. Doesn't make us God. That's not my argument. My argument is the only one that rules forever in the context of being worshipped forever, not just ruling, but ruling forever over all people who will worship him forever, the only ruler who will be worshipped forever is God. We won't be worshipped, and we won't worship one another. So those three lines prove Jesus, who is the Son of Man, is God.